Amen. All right. What a blessing. Everybody blessed? Amen. Amen. Let's do something for me. We are live streaming on the DSM app and other platforms that we have for all of our partners around the world. And so I want them to feel welcome and like they're a part. So would you welcome our DSM partners? Thank you, guys. What a blessing you are. We're in the process and our partners have made it possible for our new studio that we're building. And the Lord has opened doors to go back on television again. And so I'll be contacting our partners about that. Man, we need to get the message of grace and truth out. Amen. Amen. So I'm excited about that. Father, thank you for this sanctified time. Thank you for your word and how faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Thank you for the testimonies that are flooding in. I pray they just multiply. In Jesus' name, amen. Is it, is it Amy that had, Amy? Yeah, that, what a testimony. She's one of many that have come back and testified of the Lord healing her. She had four operations on her back and had not gotten any better. And the Lord has healed her back. So she's excited. I'm excited for you. That's, that's beautiful. One of, my, one of my good friends, I won't name him, uh, but in the healing line, I asked him what he wanted. He said, just pray for me. I'm just old. <laughs> so God quickens, God quickens our mortal bodies. Amen. <laughs> we'll go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. I'm really excited about what's on my heart. And I believe that this will help you immensely in receiving your healing and in ministering healing to your family and to your friends. And I want to deal with the issue of sin and how it relates to sickness and clear some things up. We've had many questions about this, so I'm actually answering questions by this teaching. But I know I've struggled for a long time with just the source of sickness and a lot of people are confused on where sickness comes from and things of that nature. So we're going to look at different passages here, and I believe the Lord's going to bless us. This is in John chapter 5 where Jesus healed the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. And there's a mystery associated with these healings. There's always mysteries associated with healing. We don't have all the answers on how God heals. We have a lot but we don't understand everything. We don't understand and have answers again for all the things that we face in this life, but we've got many. And Jesus is ministering to a man. There's five porches, and I can really picture this because the mystery in this story is this pool of Bethesda, an angel would stir the water, and the first person that got in got miraculously healed. I, I don't understand that, if you have insight on that, I'd appreciate it. You can, you can get with me on that because it's a mystery to me. But I can sure picture. I'm surprised there wasn't six or seven Motel 6s right by it. <laughs> <clears throat> so five porches is not out of the realm of possibility if you hear about that. And so all of these people are on these porches waiting for the angel to stir the water. And Jesus sees this lame man. He had been lame for 38 years. I want that to sink in, and there's a purpose coming up. 38 years. And Jesus is passing by, and one of the things that happened here is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. One of the ways that God heals is through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it's sad how so many of us have, have dismissed the gifts and what's available to us in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Jesus operated in the gifts of the Holy Spirit all the gifts except tongues and the interpretation of tongues. That didn't happen until Pentecost after his resurrection. But the other gifts of the Spirit, Jesus operated in. And so he's walking by and he sees this guy lame and he says, do you want to be healed? Now, I'm not trying to be mean. It's, don't, don't do this, Dwayne. <laughs> do you want to be healed? And he immediately starts making up excuses on how that, the angel will stir the water and somebody will get in there before I do. 
Uh, and so he's making up excuses. Instead of just answering the question, absolutely, I wouldn't be on this porch if I didn't want to be healed. But I've been shocked over the years at how many times I've asked people, do you want to be healed? And they'll come up with an excuse. And I'm not, I'm not saying there aren't reasons why we struggle with sickness. I'm saying we got to get past all these excuses and trust God. And so Jesus says, take up your mat, take up your bed and walk. And the power of God hits this guy and he, he folds up his mat and, and he starts walking. And listen, he doesn't even know who Jesus is. That's how good God is. That's how willing he is to heal, by the way. And so he starts walking, but guess what? It was the Sabbath. Some of you have read the Bible. <laughs> These people are still around today that are just legalistic, dogmatic, have no care in their heart for people. You'd think if a man was lame for 38 years and he got healed, you wouldn't care what day it is. You'd be excited for him. You'd have compassion. But oh no, it was the Sabbath. The Jews, verse 10, the Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. How dumb can religious people become? It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. It was like, it's the Sabbath, that's work. That's a moving company, a furniture moving company. <laughs> and trying to dismiss the goodness of God, the power of God. He answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, well, who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus withdrew and a multitude being in that place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Now that's profound. The man discovered it was Jesus he got interrogated by the Pharisees. His parents got interrogated by the, the Pharisees. And so he decides in wisdom, you people haven't done squat for me my whole life. The guy who healed me said, take up my bed and walk. I'm going with the guy that healed me. And I've been there many a time where you got to go with Jesus. Notice he said... Go and sin no more, though, lest a worse thing come upon you. Now, let that sink in for a minute. I can't fathom what could be worse than lame for 38 years. I, I don't know what could be worse than not being able to walk for 38 years. And yet Jesus said sin can be connected to sickness. And so you need to live a repentant life. You need to understand that sin gives place to Satan and he has come to still kill and destroy. Now, while it's important that we understand this, we cannot assume that everybody who is sick has personally sinned. And this is a problem within churches who believe in healing. This is a problem within Christians and Christian circles where we've seen the power of God, we've seen testimonies, we've watched God for decades heal people. And we've seen the consequences of sin in our own lives and in others' lives, but we can become innocently judgmental if we're not careful. And everybody who is sick among us or anyone struggling with something among us, the first thought you have is, well, what sin did they commit that caused this? We've grown so much as a body Jacob and I are different, and that's good. I've taught you for three and a half decades to be yourself, and finally we have a, a preacher's kid who's himself, and they want him to be me. And he's not good enough to be me. <laughs> Let it go. Where was I going? <laughs> oh, 
where was I going? I had a major point there about Jacob and, oh, when Jacob broke his arm and nearly died, had it not been for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I would have lost my son. That's why I know the gifts are real. I know how they work. I know, I know what setting they're supposed to work in that's new to most charismatics even. And it was a word of knowledge that the Lord gave me supernaturally that he was bleeding internally and was fixing to die. And the doctors missed it. And so I didn't come to the body immediately with it. I didn't want to have to deal with what sin did Sue and I commit that brought this on Jacob? Where did we miss it? I didn't need all that unbelief. I didn't need all those negative confessions. I needed, and I went to the elders who were mature, I needed somebody to agree with me in prayer for the life of my son. When Urias died for 30 minutes and was raised from the dead, the first thing Jacob wanted to do was tell the whole body, the whole church. And I feel bad about this. It's not that I doubt you. It's that I know you. <laughs> and so my response at first was not right. It wasn't, it was reactive. It was like, I don't know. We need to seek God on this. Uh, and he said, what do, you, what do you mean you don't know? I, I said, well, I don't want to have to deal with all the unbelief. Jesus used to have to run people out of a room to perform a miracle. He had to take a man one time out of a God-forsaken town and get him outside of the town to get him healed because there was so much unbelief in that town. And so I, I wavered at first. And man, I just love Jacob so much. He said, Dad, you've taught us for three and a half decades how to believe God and how to stand with one another. And I said, yes, I have. <laughs> Write the letter. And he wrote a letter, a prayer. And he had confidence that the whole church would pray right and would not be judgmental. Uh, so that's a generational shift. You remember, you, some of you don't remember, but when we, when we first got started, I mean, I was attacked constantly preaching on healing. Entire churches came out against me preaching on healing. We've come a long way. We have a long way to go, but we have come a long way. And so while unrepented sin can bring worse things upon us than whatever we're battling, we can't assume that everybody that's struggling with a disease or a handicap or a sickness has personally sinned. Everybody understand that? Yeah. Well, let me show you the opposite now in John chapter 9. John chapter 9, look at verse 1. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. Now, where did they get that thinking in the first place? They must have known some kind of connection with sin and sickness. But I mean, you know, you need the Holy Spirit and you don't need to be dumb to the second power. <laughs> the man's born blind and you ask the Son of God, who sinned? The baby? <laughs> or the parents? As if a baby can commit a sin in the womb to bring about, <clears throat> excuse me, blindness. That's just sad. I love Jesus' answer. Verse 3. Neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Jesus said neither one of them sin. But listen, he didn't say sin had nothing to do with blindness. He said it wasn't their personal sin. Whose sin has brought all this sickness and disease into the world? Adam. Adam's sin, the curse of the fall 
has brought all this handicap, disease, viruses, allergies. Thank you, Jesus. I believe I receive. <laughs> it's sin in the world. And I don't know if you figured it out yet, but you don't have an immortal body. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> You're dying. Again, some of you fast right in front of me. <laughs> and there's people that argue with me about this to this day, that we can believe God and not physically die. Look at your high school pictures, saints. I didn't mean for it to hurt, <laughs> but I get it. I get it. I, I got a word of knowledge one time of some friends who Sue and I had been praying for their son. Their son had been diagnosed with terminal cancer, and he was a young man. I don't remember his age. Uh, she probably doesn't even know what I'm talking about right now. It'll hit her later. But... uh. Anyway, we'd been praying for him and for them, and the Lord spoke to me and gave me a word of knowledge to call them. And I called them, and I don't want to name their names, but I said, if I missed it, no problem. But what if I didn't miss it? I believe the Lord showed me that you are self-destructing, that you're condemning yourself, and you're stuck in unbelief trying to figure out what you did wrong to cause your son to contract cancer. And I gave them this scripture and said, the Lord told me to tell you, it's not his sin. It's not your sin. It's sin in the world. And when you get that straight, now you can fight with confidence. Now you can quit self-destructing in guilt and condemnation. Now you can stand. And after doing all to stand, you can stand there for having your loins girt about with the truth, etc., cetera, et cetera. And so, man, they repented right on the phone, said, that's exactly what we do. And we've been crying out to God, what did we do wrong? One of the things I wish I could take time to help every one of you individually, we just can't. Because of what I just taught, some of you may be struggling with something, and you're stuck on what sin, again, have I committed to bring this upon myself, or even something worse. You need to understand God is not withholding information from you like that. That if you have sinned and brought something upon you, God is merciful and God is compassionate. And God has already forgiven you of all your sin and is not holding your sin against you. And if you have given something place, the Lord will show you. He'll be faithful to say, yeah, you've got unforgiveness in your heart. And it's creating a lot of issues for you. Yeah, you, you have envy and jealousy against others. And it's rottening your bones. I mean, he will show you if there is something in your heart that you're giving Satan place. God's not withholding that information. And you don't have to beg and cry and be stuck there for months. No, I guarantee you there's people all the time say, well, I just don't know if God ever speaks to me. It's like, what? When's the last time you sinned? Okay, I guess none of you sinned. Man, the minute I sin, I hear God. The minute I misstep and get on the wrong path, I hear Him clear. I hear His chastening. I hear His discipline. I hear His compassion. Dwayne, that's not right, and you know better. Dwayne, you don't want to go that way. And so we don't need to wrestle with this sin issue personally. And then if we understand it's sin in the world and God anointed Jesus, Acts 10, 38 says, God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Yeah. Healing is good. I've actually heard religious people say God is the one that made the man blind so God could heal him. That is not true. Jesus said, neither this man or his parents have sinned, but I'm here 
as a light to do the works of God. And the works of God isn't to blind you. The works of God is to heal you. And healing is good. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing what? Good. good. Healing is good. Healing all that were oppressed of the devil. There was a woman bound over where she couldn't even, she couldn't even stand up. And Jesus said, ought not this daughter of Abraham be loosed whom Satan has bound this many years? So a lot of this is just demonic attack that we have to learn to fight and we have to learn to resist. And if you don't learn to resist sin, you'll yield. Sickness is no different. You have to learn to fight. You have to learn to resist, to draw nigh to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Now, this is where I've helped people more than anything. Three sources of sickness, personal sin, and we can be quick to repent and be healed. I know I won't have time to get there. I was going to talk to the media department. I may get there next week. But James chapter 5 says, is there any sick among you? Any. Let them call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he's committed sin, they'll be forgiven. God is simply saying sin doesn't have to stop the power of God in our life because of grace. Where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. So we can't get stuck on this sin issue and be condemned. When, when I died and I went through what I went through, looking back, had I not known what I've taught you, I wouldn't be here today. I would have self-destructed with guilt. The devil would have hammered. He tried to hammer my head because I had gone and walked in in a measure of health for 40 years. And bam, it was instant. Five arteries gone. And I only had minutes to make a decision and had to call the elders. And again, Sue involved, my kids involved. But I guarantee you, the devil would have loved to have kept hammering my head. The first thought he, he hit me with is, how can you be a preacher that preaches healing and be where you're at? And had I not known the love of God, had I not known God's will to heal and to heal all, and that I have no personal sin that has contributed to this, and this is sin in the world... This is, this is, mama did this to me. <laughs> this is genetics. And I had to forgive my mama. <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Do you know how many things we have and problems we have that are genetic? They're inherited. And we have to fight against that. And so I had to clear this issue up that, okay, if there's any sin, I remember going to Jesus and saying, I know it's sink or swim now. If I've done something... I know you'll speak to me. And I had done nothing. Then I'm going to fight with everything within me. And I look forward to giving a testimony here soon in Jesus' name of my full recovery of what God is doing supernaturally to my heart even as I stand here right now. Because I know it's sin in the world. And I know it's demonic. The devil would like nothing more than to take me out. And God would like nothing more than to keep me in. Because <laughs> I'm going to be a blessing to many more people on this side than on that side. And so personal sin is an issue, but you can't get stuck there. You got to know how much God loves you. Sin in the world is real. Evil in the world is is real. Disease is real. All these things that fight against our bodies. 
Number three that is confusing for most people is the curse of the law. The curse of the law of Moses. In Romans chapter 4 verse 15, Paul says it was the law that worked God's wrath. Now I guarantee you, if you hadn't heard me teach on this or somebody, you're confused. Because a lot of people will tell you, well, it's sin that works God's wrath. Well, no, sin was in the world before the law, and God was compassionate and merciful and long-suffering. But when the law came, my gosh, lightning from heaven came down on picking up sticks on Saturday. <laughs> Amen. Wrath from heaven was revealed. God's curses and punishment was revealed under the law, and part of that was sickness. And this is so confusing for people. Again, Deuteronomy 28, I've only one time read those curses out loud. They are so horrible that I can't read them out loud, not get emotional, how bad they are. The first 15 verses of Deuteronomy 28, if you obey me, you'll be blessed. From verse 15 to 68, if you disobey me, these curses will come upon you. And it says, the Lord will put these on you. The botch of Egypt. I still don't know what that is, but I don't want it. <laughs> Mildew. Sue said something a few years ago, and I said, that's a curse. I don't believe in mildew in our house. Talks about them being under siege. And getting so hungry and starving, they'll eat their own children. It's terrible. Terrible stuff. And so people read all that. They grow up in church. And they hear about all that. And it gets confusing. Let me give you an example. Example one, Miriam was struck with leprosy. And it was God that did it to her. Now, I've heard some so-called word and faith preachers try to explain that away. I don't have to explain that away. God did it. Her and Aaron murmured against Moses and his authority. And it's interesting, it says that Moses married an Ethiopian woman. Then they murmured against his authority. I don't know if you're catching the connection. She was a black woman. Amen or oh me. I know meltdowns are happening all over the world. And they didn't like it. And instead of talking to Moses about it directly and dealing with that kind of issue in your heart, they challenged his authority. And the Bible says God came down in a cloud, told Aaron and Miriam, get outside the tent. They got outside the tent, and when the cloud lifted, Miriam was leprous. Aaron found repentance fast. Her brother Aaron looks at her, and she's white as snow, and she, Aaron looks at Moses and said, forgive us. We have sinned greatly. Deuteronomy, now listen to this, Deuteronomy 24 Verse 8 and 9 says it was the Lord that struck her with leprosy. There's a man named Korah in the Bible, Dathan and Abiram. And they and 250 people came up against Moses' authority and murmured and complained to God and falsely accused the leader and God says, bring them all out to their tents. And Dathan and Korah and Abram, Abram, and their families. The Bible says the ground opened up and swallowed them. Alive. And closed in on them. Man, I've been in some deacon meetings. You just want the ground to open up. 
God, can we go under the law here just for 15 minutes? And if they die an unnatural death, let it be known who's here in God. I know you've never thought like that. Pray for me. Then fire came out of the tabernacle and consumed the 250 rebels that were with those other three. That was God. That was wrath. That was a curse. That was punishment. Go to, go to Numbers 21. This one used to bother me. A lot of this stuff bothers me. It really bothers me when people say there's no wrath to come. There's no more wrath with God. There's no wrath from God on us. Numbers chapter 21 verse 6. This is where the entire children of Israel murmured against Moses. Y'all need to say nice things about me is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and the Bible says God sent serpents among them and thousands of them died from snake bite. God did it. They were poisoned and died of snake poisoning. Look at, look at verse 6 of Numbers 21. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned. <laughs> you think? But I guarantee if this church started filling up with snakes, I'd be, I'd be repenting. <laughs> we've sinned. For we've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. Moses prayed for the people. Now look at this. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was... If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. That is over the top. Now again, people read all that, and I could, I could, I could go hours with how the Lord put those plagues upon Egypt as judgment for Egypt's sin. How the Lord made them sick. But it was a curse, the curse of the law. It was punishment. It was wrath. It was not chastening. It wasn't discipline. What did the people that died of snake bit or bite learn? It was punishment. And if you don't understand Galatians 3, go to Galatians chapter 3 then you'll falsely accuse God of killing our kids, of putting cancer on us, of making us sick. I can't tell you over the years how many times I've said, God didn't do this to us. And people will quote something out of the Old Testament that was a curse. That was God revealing wrath from heaven on all disobedience. From the smallest of sin to the greatest of sin, wrath came down from heaven. And people think, well, if God did that to them, then he's doing it to us. There's been a cross. There's been a pole. It used to bother me when I would read that. Because that's the type of the cross. And God said, put a serpent on it. 
You'd think God would say, put a lamb on it. But how many of you know the lamb became sin for you and I? In Galatians 3, 10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith, yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. My goodness, that's one of the most profound statements in the Bible. The law is not of faith. Romans chapter 14 says, whatever's not of faith is sin. I know what you're thinking I said, but I didn't. You thought I said the law was sin. No, for me to appeal to the law to be made righteous is sin. It's not faith. For me to appeal to my own works to be healed is not faith. Cursed. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the what? See, a lot of you, I love you, but you don't even know what you've been redeemed from. Well, brother, I've been redeemed from sin. Okay, I'll give you that. Well, I've been redeemed from Satan's authority over me. I'll give you that. But you can't stop there. What you've been redeemed of that should produce such joy in your heart is the curse of the law. You don't need to fear what man can do to you. But what God can do. And in his mercy and his grace, he's redeemed us from any curse of the old covenant law. Where you see God did this, that was temporary. It was for a purpose. And that's what Jesus died to redeem us from. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So see, the serpent on the pole that was a type of the cross was symbolic of Jesus becoming sin for you and I. And that's why I still preach healing comes from the cross. Because Jesus didn't just bear my sins, he bore my sicknesses. My disease on the cross. Why? That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. This is talking about how Jesus did not die for the righteous because there, no, there was none. Jesus didn't die for good little troopers. There were no good little troopers. <laughs> Jesus died for sinners and we qualified. And how that he gave his life for all of us. Verse 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. There is wrath coming to this planet at the appearing of Jesus and his kingdom. There is God's wrath that will be poured out on all those who rebel against God and refuse to believe and accept God's love and compassion for them. That's what you and I have been saved from. And so now when something goes bad, we can't falsely accuse God. Whether it's our health, our prosperity, our families, our church. We have to understand how much God really is for us. And I hate to keep going back to my testimony, but that's how I overcome the devil. is by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. (laughs) 
<laughs> Sorry, I get so tickled. They're about to put me under. And I mean, I'm not in a good place. And I'm in the operating room. And they, they kind of are doing their thing. I said, hey, everybody come here. They all gathered around. I looked at the doctor. I said, you believe in God? He was, I think, Hindu. I believe in many gods. I said, that won't work. <laughs> I said, uh, you could hear the snickering of the staff. I said, you believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah. I believe in Jesus. You believe he's the son of God? Yeah, I do believe he's the son of God. I said, well, I'm fixing to pray, and I'm going to pray in his name. And you're going to agree with me <laughs> that you're going to do the best job you've ever done. <laughs> yes, yes, I believe in God. Yes, yes. <laughs> I made everybody in there bow their head, all the nurses, the anesthesiologist, the doctor, and man, I went to praying, and I'm telling you what, we had a prayer meeting. <laughs> you could feel the presence of God in that room. What I'm trying to say is, I literally, absolutely had no fear. And you don't know what you're going to do and how you're going to feel. People all the time say, well, if I was them, I wouldn't have done that. No, you'd have done worse. <laughs> you know how people are? thinking they know what somebody else should have done and what they would have done if they were them. You don't know nothing. <laughs> and so I didn't know if I'm literally facing death, how am I going to feel? And to have no fear, absolutely no fear, looking back is amazing to me, to be honest that I would even think I would have some type of fear or panic or something, and yet I didn't. Why? I knew God's will to heal me. And I knew the worst case scenario, if I die, I'll be more alive than I've ever been, and I'll come back, I'll get this body, it'll be resurrected, and its veins will be perfect. I just get the opportunity to work by faith on my veins now. See, a lot of times we think, well, if we really believed all this and we had a certain amount of knowledge, we wouldn't even face some of these things. Faith does not make you immune from trouble. It equips you to have peace in the midst of trouble. And so I'm, I'm praying for you. I'm believing for you. You know, I've got time. This is a miracle. There's something wrong with that clock. <laughs> Let's just turn over to James real quick. Because this is fascinating to me. A lot of people think it's not God's will to heal all because all don't get healed. I have people ask me that all the time. Well, if it's God's will to heal all, how come all don't get healed? Well, how many of you know it's God's will to save all? then how come all aren't saved? We don't know. I don't know how anybody can go to hell. I can't, I can't understand that. I can't understand somebody rejecting God's love for them, rejecting the sacrifice for all their sins, that they can be accepted by faith with a holy God, because all of us know we're not holy in and of ourselves. Why would anybody turn that down? How could anybody know there's a God? And the Bible says we all know there's a God and reject him. But it happens every day. Hell is enlarging itself and its mouth as I speak, receiving the wicked. And I can't explain it. I just don't know how you can deny Jesus. And just because I don't see everybody get healed, it doesn't change God's love and will to heal. 
See, don't get confused just because God wills to heal that you'll automatically be healed. I hope that makes sense. And God's will's not being done in this earth. That's why Matthew chapter 6 says you have to pray for God's will to be done. If God's will was just automatic, why did Jesus teach us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven? How many of you know there's no sick people in heaven? Then God wants us well in the earth. It doesn't mean we won't get sick any more than we being made righteous means we won't ever sin. I've been made the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus. But I've sinned. And I was still righteous in the eyes of God. That's why I can confess I'm healed when symptoms are attacking my body. Because I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus, not by my body's testimony. And we're never going to get to the miracle, saints. Most of us in here believe in healing. I'm not trying to convince most of us. Now, there's thousands of people watching. That's a different story. That they just haven't been taught. But we need to get to the place of signs and wonders and miracles. There's some things we need that are beyond healing. Just like what I need for my heart is not a healing, it's a miracle. And I'm standing for my miracle. But I'll never get there if I don't believe it's God's will no matter what. James chapter 5, I quoted it, but look. Verse 13. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing a psalm. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall or will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Now look at this though. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Why would you throw that in there? Because a lot of times when we're sick, the devil pounds our head about sin. And you have to realize, if you have sinned, God loves you, you're forgiven. Repent. Receive your forgiveness. Yeah, but man, I'm bitter toward my family. Well, repent. Amen. 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 And I've taught you what it means to forgive. That a lot of times when you forgive, it doesn't mean you trust. It doesn't mean you don't have ill feelings that you have to work through. But we can forgive anybody for anything, just like we've been forgiven And look at the next verse. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So a part of a good community, a part of what we're trying to do with our partners and better connect with our partners is community where we can be honest. Where we can say, I messed up there. But God has forgiven me. And we be healed. So a lot of times our healing is connected to a confession of a trespass. And that's why it's important if you're struggling with something to make sure you search your heart. And that you don't have any ill will in your heart. Any ill will toward anybody. Because it's tough going through this life and not getting hurt, not getting offended, not getting in unforgiveness, which just the body just breaks down. And God wants us to be a community where we encourage one another that, hey, I've messed up, but boy, God's forgiven me and I'm blessed and we can be honest. Well, did anybody get anything? That was awesome.